I want to welcome you. If Obviously, if you're church family, we love you. If you're a guest here this morning, thank you for joining us at Harvest this morning. Our pastors, Pastor Mike and Rhonda, are out on a short little uh, visit with family. They'll be, Pastor Mike will be back next Sunday. And I just want to encourage you to be praying for them, praying for refreshment and joy while they're out for safe travels. And if you're a guest, Come back again next Sunday so you can hear him preach, because he preaches a powerful word from the Word of God, and so I really want to encourage you to come back and be a part of that. Um, I'm always so thankful for our pastors. I'm thankful for their heart uh, to be an equipping church, and that they uh, they, they put their actions where their words are. And so throughout the years, throughout the decades, actually, I've been a recipient of that equipping. And I'm always so grateful when Pastor Mike asks, hey, can you share a little bit of the word? I love having an opportunity to share the word, but I never take their trust lightly. I just am so appreciative of that. And I take time to study and, and hopefully deliver a word that speaks to you. So that's my hope this morning, is that I deliver a word that challenges you and encourages you along the way. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity this morning. Lord, I thank you that you go before us. Lord, that you pave the way. I pray, Holy Spirit, for your anointing this morning, that I would represent Jesus well. And Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our ears to hear what you have to say. And Lord, that we would be the people that would not just hear what you have to say, but we would be quick to obey and bring honor and glory to you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Mike recently taught a short series on hearing the still small voice of God from 1 Kings, and I'd like to build on that this morning. In this account from 1 Kings chapter 19, we find Elijah running from Jezebel as she was threatening his life. He had slayed all of the 450 of Baal's prophets, and Jezebel said, I'm going to make you like one of them. I'm after you now. Your life is in my crosshairs. And he ran from Jezebel's reach. He fell into a great depression once he got out of her reach. He actually asked the Lord to take his life. But God responded with an angel providing supernatural provision to Elijah and a 40-day and night journey to Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. And in that place, Elijah took shelter in a cave. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, it says, And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts. For the children of Israel, I have forsaken your covenant, torn down altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. Oh, wait, for the children. Sorry, he did not forsake. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? God was not in the mighty wind, the earthquake, or the fire. He could have been, but he wasn't. Rather, he made himself known to Elijah in a place that was far less chaotic by the way of a still, small voice. And when you think about it, there's something interesting about the still, small voice. How many of you have a friend who is very soft-spoken? Can you think of someone? I can think of someone, too. I have a friend that I know well. She's very soft-spoken, and it causes me, when I'm around this individual, to lean in to hear what they have to say. It causes me to lean in. Because of our relationship, I'm familiar with how that person is going to speak. And I know that if I want to hear what's being said, I need to be more intentional with how I listen. Amen? 
Amen? I have to tune other things out so I can hear what this person is going to say. I have to look in this person's direction to hear what they're going to say. I have to stay focused, and oftentimes I have to get closer to hear what they're going to say. And above all else, I need to place value on what they're going to say. The same is true in our relationship with God. First, we need to know that he wants to speak to us. Amen? God wants to speak to each and every one of you. He didn't create us so that we could live some ambiguous life going from sludge to sludge. That's what the world would tell us. The world would tell us that maybe we have no purpose, it's all up to us, but God said no. In his word, he said, I created you and I want you to go from glory to glory, to know me, to walk with me, to hear from me, to know the purposes that I have for your life. That's what I created you for. And that you would go from glory to glory, that you would fulfill your purpose, that you would live a fruitful life, and when all is said and done, that you would go on in eternity with him in heaven. That's a good promise, amen, from the word of God. I would rather take that version any day from the world's version of what the world is trying to put on me, amen? But God's voice often isn't in the ruckus or the noise, the shaking or the flashiest display. His voice isn't in all the clamor of the world. In our news headlines, I don't think you'll hear the voice of God there. In our media, I don't think you'll get the voice of God there. Our gossip at work? No, that's not the voice of God. The pressures or the fear, the angst or anxiety that we hear in us, inside our hearts and our minds? I just want to give you a little bit of discernment. That's not the voice of God. How about accusations? Things that kick you when you're down. Let me be clear. The enemy is an accuser of the brethren. That is not the voice of God. God will work through conviction. He'll bring you into right standing with him. But if there's an accusing spirit on replay in your mind, let me be clear, that is not the voice of God. His voice is often a quiet prompting, a nudge, or a sense of peace. The greatest ways the Holy Spirit has spoken to me and directed me throughout my life has been through his word, through sitting in sound biblical teaching, under sound biblical teaching and sound biblical counsel. Let me be clear on that. There's a difference between counsel and sound biblical counsel, wise counsel. You can go get counsel nowadays anywhere that will be very affirming to the way you want to think. But I need to rewire my thinking. (laughs) I want to have God's thoughts on the matter. So there's a difference between counsel and sound biblical counsel and finding wisdom in that. Amen? Do you see the difference in that? Another way that the Holy Spirit has often directed me is through peace. And it's very important on what we feast our thoughts on, that we're feasting on the Word of God, allowing it to take root in our hearts, allowing it to renew our minds, and providing us with truth and discernment. We need that gift of discernment. Amen? Amen. Like Noah built an ark before there was ever any evidence of a storm, we need to ensure that we are intentional about building our thoughts and our faith through the Word of God, through prayer, through fellowship with other believers, and walking with the Holy Spirit. And when you do hear from God, because you do, and you will, How do you know that it's actually God? Has anyone ever had that question? How do I know if this is actually God? Well, let me tell you, God will never speak to you contrary to his word. He'll never speak to you contrary to his character. And that's why it's so vital that we're in the word, that we meditate on the word, that we get it into our heart, so that when we hear the voice of God, we hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we can go, yeah, that aligns with what the Word of God says. Amen? Amen? And when you learn to hear from God, I want to encourage you this morning. This is where I'm driving this point home. When you learn to hear from God, when God speaks to you, you have a responsibility to do something with that revelation. Amen? We all have a responsibility, not just to put it on the shelf, but there's a responsibility that we have to build and to walk out that revelation to trust him and to stand on his promises. 
I love this scripture. It's one, of, it's one of the scriptures that just resonates in my heart from Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3. And this is the amplified version. It says, through skillful and godly wisdom is a house, a life, a home, a family. Some versions say businesses, communities. It can go on and expand because God is an expanding God. Through skillful and godly wisdom is a house built. And by understanding, it is established on a sound and a good foundation. Where does that skillful and godly wisdom come from? Right? It comes from our Father God. And it matters how we store those treasures of his wisdom in our hearts, what we hold near and dear. And as you walk with him, the Holy Spirit reveals truths to you that are yours to treasure, they're yours to pray out, and they're yours to build upon. We have a responsibility to just not hear God, but to act on what he shares with us. Sometimes our mind wanders from these truths, and God provides, sometimes our minds wander from the truths that God provides, and our thoughts waver, and they become cluttered with concerns, with worry, with distractions, and we find ourselves in a mess. And that's why the Bible teaches us that we need to renew our minds Take every thought captive and to think on these things. This is a lot of scripture right here, but these are three foundational scriptures that we're familiar with, but we need to be reminded of this often, don't we? Sometimes we just need to stir this up and remind ourselves of it. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That means getting back into the word, reminding ourselves what the Holy Spirit has shown us. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. And what does that look like? It goes, okay, I've got this thought. It's rattling in my mind. Does it align with the word of God? Does it stay or does it go? bringing every thought into captivity, into the obedience of Christ. And I love this scripture because sometimes people get this idea that following Jesus is so constricting. It's freedom, amen? Amen. Following Jesus is freedom. And God says, here, here's all the whatevers that you can think on. Here's all the whatevers that you can fill your mind on. Whatever things are true, you can think on whatever is true. Whatever things are noble, think on that. Whatever is noble. Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, are lovely, of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Meditate on these things. God gives us a vast array of things that we can fill our minds with that will build our faith and that will bring us into victory with him. Amen? Amen. But we have a responsibility to think on these things. And this morning what I want to do is share some examples of this with, in my experience with you as a parent. Because now for over half of my life, I've operated in that role. I've been a mom. <laughs> over half of my life. But over the years, I've walked with the Lord. I've learned how to wait on the Lord and his leading in all areas of my life. And I've been able to hear and discern his voice in every area of my life, including relationships. I have testimony on that I could share with you. How to minister to and, other, and serve others. I have testimony of the Lord's leading in that area where I've just felt that still small voice, that prompting to go talk with someone, that prompting to go pray with someone, that prompting to drop a word of encouragement. And later they say, you don't know how timely that was. And it was the Lord's leading. I have testimonies where God has led me in major purchases like homes and cars. Mm -hmm. Very practical, very practical. The Holy Spirit cares about that. And he's also led me in smaller purchases like, hey, there's a great sale over here you're going to be blessed by. Or you can take advantage of this deal and you can bless others through that. I have testimonies where God has led me through different career moves. And I've seen God's hand of provision over my life. Not because it was my great idea to go back to school, but because there was a still small voice saying, hey, now it's time. And I'm going to equip you and I'm going to position you into something different that's going to sustain you in the days to come. I have testimony of that. 
I could go on and on and on with examples and testimonies, but today I'm going to start with what I've been over half of my life. I'm going to share some testimonies from being a parent and raising kids. Because I'll tell you one thing that's for certain, raising kids was definitely a component in my life that caused me to draw closer to Jesus. I think we've got really stellar parents in our church. I'm amazed by you. I'm amazed by the wisdom and grace that you operate in. But to be honest with you, when I became a parent, I had to take it up with God like, who do you really think I'm mature enough for this responsibility? <laughs> I'm still growing up myself, and there was a lot of times that just being a mom drove me to Jesus. I had to hear his voice, and so I'm going to share from, from that experience this morning. I've learned how to hear his voice. I've learned how to store his truths and his leading in my heart and to keep placing my faith and my confidence in what he said beyond what my circumstances were showing, amen, and build on those truths. And one of the ways that I've done this is I have made it one of my foundational rules in my life is to follow after peace, to follow hard after peace. Psalms 34, 14 says, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And I've raised up my kids this way. I've always told them, they say, mom, I've got this I'm facing. I've got this decision I'm facing. I said, well, where do you have peace? Where do you have peace? Remember when the global positioning system came out, the GPS. I took that little nugget and I changed those acronyms in my life. God's peace steers. It's my GPS. It's my internal GPS. If I don't have peace on a situation, I don't go there. I just don't go there. If I'm faced with a, a situation and there's not peace in it, I don't go there. Now, I want to clarify, peace is not head knowledge. Because I've been faced with different situations where I've had peace about something, I've felt the leading of God on something, and in my mind, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't calculate. But there's a peace that I cannot deny, and so I step forward where that peace leads me. Can anyone else attest to that, that you've had that? Yeah, and so it's not head knowledge, is it? And you know what else peace isn't? It's not... um, It's not comfort. It's not comfort. It's not that, well, this is where I feel comfortable, so that's where I'll follow. Oftentimes, peace will take you out of your comfort zone. Case in point, most recently, Sri Lanka. (laughs) I had the opportunity to go on a missions trip to Sri Lanka. It's something that I've literally wanted to do for decades. And can I just say thank you, church, for being a mission-driven church? Thank you for giving, and thank you for caring about the nations. It opened up new perspectives for me, and I know the Holy Spirit is going to continue to unfold things in the days and weeks to come. But what a blessing to go. But can I just be really honest with you? I was honest with Pastor Mike and Rhonda, too. So so excited to go, but I said, this is taking me out of my comfort zone on so many different levels. (laughs) There is not a place where I feel comfortable about this, but... If I don't go, I'm not following after peace. And I want to follow after peace. So peace is not head knowledge. It's not where you're comfortable. It's not a state of zen. Amen? It's not. But it's knowing that you know because you know. And you follow after peace. And you walk in that. Does that make sense? All right. I love Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. It says, And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or turn to the left, this is the way, walk in it. And I feel like the Holy Spirit has been faithful to me in that, where I've just walked with the Lord, and I've come up against different situations, circumstances, decisions, and I've sensed the Holy Spirit go, Here's the way, walk in it. So when you hear from the Lord, you have a responsibility. I'm repeating this again, and you'll hear it again and again in the sermon. You have a responsibility to keep your faith there. You have a responsibility to build there. And how do you keep your faith there? You meditate on the word. You prayerfully ponder what the Holy Spirit has revealed to you. You treasure it in your heart, because what you ponder has power. Amen? It directs the course of our life. The Bible says, as a man thinks, so is he. 
It matters what we ponder on, like a song on repeat. You have something replaying in your mind all the time, and you have authority and power to direct what those thoughts are. Luke chapter 2, verses 15 through 19, is a story of a mom that had some heart ponderings. It says, When the angels of the Lord had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things, and she pondered them in her heart. Mary was a young mom. And yes, she was raising the Son of God. No pressure. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no pressure. She had that revelation. And she's hearing these truths and these bits about her son. You better believe that influenced her prayer life. Oh, yeah. Amen? That influenced how she raised him up, what she spoke over him, the destiny she spoke over him, the identity that she spoke into about him. Can you, do you see that? And she pondered those things in her heart. She treasured those things in her heart. Joseph and his dad, Jacob, is another situation. Joseph had these big dreams. God revealed some huge truths to him, right? And it says Joseph's brothers envied him and were jealous of him, but his father, Jacob, observed the saying and he pondered over it. I believe he prayed over it. I believe he even had issue when he thought his son had died years later, like God. There was something about that dream that spoke to my heart. So how is this playing out? But you know what? He only saw this much of the picture at the time, right? And God sees the bigger picture, amen? And he is a faithful father, and that's why we can trust him, amen? 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 Because there's more to come. In both cases, there was revelation given to the things to come. Insights into the lives of the children that they would be raising. The word tells us, wise people build. God desires to give you insights, direction, and wisdom in how to pray, live, and lead. He's faithful to give you hope and guide you. And when he does it, it's vital that you store that truth in your heart. You get in the theme? You stand on that truth. You pray it out, even when adversity comes, because it will come. It's a treasure. And you act on that truth. And as you do, you will see it build. So my question for you this morning is, what is it that God has revealed to you that he's given you to ponder and to steward? What is he giving you to nurture and to build upon that you need to act on? Psalm 119, verses 15 through 16 says, I ponder every morsel of wisdom from you. I attentively watch how you've done it. I relish everything you've told me in life, and I won't forget a word of it. Now let's talk a little bit about my story as a mom. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's such a great charge, isn't it? Yeah. Funny thing is, when my kids showed up, they didn't come with an instruction manual. Not even a courtesy tag. This is the way they should go. How about your kids? Any of yours? No. Other thing is, is that none of them had the courtesy of being the same. They were all, they were, I have three kids. All three of them are very much their own individual. So there was no cookie cutter scenario. It would have been convenient if what worked for kid number one would work for kid number two and work for kid number three. I'd be an ace, right? Not the case. Not the case at all. They all had their own unique bent. I had to figure out. They all had their own unique things that, you know, there's one that says, I got all the spankings, and there's one that says, I, you know, no, it was me, and, and I know they only got two. Anyway, all the things, right? So when Caleb, my son, was about three years old, the one, the one thing that I knew to do with as a parent was I knew I needed Jesus, and I knew I needed to get them in church. And praise God, that's, that's how we did. You need Jesus, and you need to be in church. So when he was about three years old, we were living in a two-bedroom apartment. I was doing the dishes. He was sitting at the kitchen table coloring. And I thought, I'm going to take advantage of this time and talk to my son about Jesus. 
And so I said to him, I said, Caleb, where does Jesus live? And I'm drying a dish. Where does Jesus live? And Caleb says, well, Jesus lives in my heart. I said, that's right. I kept doing my dishes. And then he paused, he put his crayon down, and he looked me square in the eye, and he said, be careful with my heart. And right then and there, I sensed the Holy Spirit come up behind me and say, this is the way. This is what you walk in. So right then and there, I treasured that in my heart because I knew that was from the Lord. Be careful with my heart. And I determined then and there that I would raise up my son to know what it means to guard your heart. Because scripture teaches us to keep and guard your heart with all vigilance, above all that you guard, for out of it flows the springs of life. Some translations say, out of it will map the course of your life. But I was raising a son that would be a man of character, nobility, and integrity. I was raising a son that would know God and that would make Jesus speak to others. And so it wasn't just about guarding his heart, but I also raised him up that you are a guardian and a protector of others' hearts. So you are not a man that will take advantage of, abuse, or use the hearts of others, but you are a man that will rise up and you'll be a guardian of the hearts of others, a protector of the hearts of others. And I've declared that over his life. When he was a little guy, grade school, he had this thing in his heart that he wanted to be part of the U.S. Air Force. We didn't come from a military background. You better believe we're military now. And, but <laughs> my son-in-law serves, my son serves. I said, Caleb, what is it about the Air Force? He said, Mom, as long as there's bad guys in this earth and I can do something to protect you and the girls, I'm going to do what I can do. He's a protector. He's a protector of hearts. Raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Incidentally, Caleb's going to be promoted next month to captain in the U.S. Air Force. Amen? Amen. Thank you. So what I prayed for Caleb, I pray over you, that you would guard your heart, that you would feast on what God has for you and stand firm in it. Church, that you would be a protector, a nurturer, and advocates for the hearts of others, and that you'd be able to share the love of Jesus with them in a powerful way, that you could take people to Jesus, that they would know him. Amen? Caitlin's another example of heart ponderings. When she was a little kid, that girl could not walk a straight line. Everywhere we went, she is dancing, her arms are going, she's doing the little shimmy with her shoulders, doing all this stuff. We couldn't go through Walmart that she wouldn't take up the whole aisle. It was just like, oh my gosh, this girl just dances everywhere she goes. So I got a clue, right? So around five years old, I sat her down and I said, Caitlin, I'm signing you up for dance lessons. And she was horrified. To my surprise, she looked at me and she said, oh, no, 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 I do not want to do dance lessons. And I said, I don't understand. Everywhere we go, you're dancing, you're twirling, your arms are going everywhere we go. She goes, well, Mom, that's because I always have a song in my heart. And again, I felt the Holy Spirit say, hey, this is the way. Walk in it. And I knew that she had a gifting in her for music, a love for music, and a love for Jesus. But here's the thing. Sometimes we think that just because we have a gifting, we can just coast. We can just, we are gifted. And what it took was it took time. It took investment. It took um, finding someone to get her involved with lessons. And I was pretty picky about who we did lessons with. Because here's the thing, I know that she has a call of God in her life. And so when I got her into music lessons, I made sure I got her into music lessons with someone that loves Jesus and knows how to worship. And so when she was in music lessons, sometimes there was 20 minutes of piano, and sometimes there was 20 minutes of discipleship. There was a deposit in her life. And through the years, I've seen God grow her in her gifts. And This is what I want to pray over you this morning, likewise, is that each and every one of you has a gift. God placed a gift in each and every one of you, but you have a responsibility to nurture that gift, amen? It doesn't just come naturally necessarily, as easy as that would be. Sometimes it takes time to build that skill, amen? So that's my prayer for you. 
is that you would take time to build the skills and the gifts that God has put, you, put inside of you, that you would invest in that, and that you would take responsibility to steward those gifts. Amen? Amen. One more story, because I've got three kids. <laughs> My oldest daughter, Kelsey, when she was little, I was really busy. I was going to school to be a nurse. I was working. I was raising my daughter. Um, six hours of sleep on any given night was like sleeping in. It was a luxury because between studies and all the things on my plate, oftentimes it was a four-hour night of sleep. And one night I was just laying on the floor crying out to God. I had hit a wall and I was just like, Lord, I need you. And as a small child, Kelsey started marching in circles around me, praying and singing praises to God. She knew exactly where she could turn to help her mama. And right then and there, I saw a strength and a determination in my daughter. I know to this day, I've seen it again and again, that girl will walk through fire. She'll walk through fire with others to make sure they get to the other side. And I just felt the Holy Spirit in that moment say, lean in. This is her gift. She has a strength and a determination. She knows Jesus even at a young age. Her commitment, love, and loyalty to those she cares about is unmatched. And I'm so emotional right now. I apologize. I prayed for her to walk in that strength and that steadiness with discernment, wisdom, and God's timing. Because when you have that inside of you, you have to wait on the Lord, right? You can't just go trailblazing into the fire. You have to wait on the Lord. But church, that's what I pray for you today as well. When you're facing things and you're walking with others and you're walking them through the fire, I pray for you for a strength and a steadiness in your discernment, your wisdom, and knowing God's timing. Amen? Amen? So I've seen these examples in my life. I've seen the faithfulness of God. I've seen him build our family and our reach for the kingdom of God in ways that I never would have dreamed, mighty and effective ways. And I've seen God protect us and carry us through torrential storms in life, both literal and figurative. But I want to ask some of you, can any of you relate to these stories? Do any of you have, raise your hands, please raise your hands high. Church, look around. These are all testimonies. So I want you to see the people that have their hands raised, and if you're just needing a little bit of encouragement in the Lord, like, how do I hear from God? Where those hands were raised, go ask them for a cup of coffee. <laughs> because there is power in hearing the testimonies of others. And church, if you're not sharing those testimonies, I want you to step out in a new boldness because there's power in sharing your testimony. It really puts the enemy under your feet and it lifts up what Jesus has done in your life, what he's doing and what he will continue to do, and it encourages others. So please share the testimonies of God's leading in your life. He's faithful. And I got to be completely transparent. There have been times where it is hard because the storm is raging and it's been hard to hear the voice of God. But here's the thing. I've never had to do it alone. That's the value and the joy and the loveliness of being part of a church family. Amen? Amen. It's not our idea of a social club. It's God's idea of a church family that comes together, that rallies around you, that knows how to battle with you, that knows how to encourage and lift you up so that if you're in the midst of the storm, they can speak life, they can speak God's truth, they can speak peace, they can say, come on, we're going to walk through this fire together. Amen? Amen. We, I love the church of God. And one thing I want to say, if you're a guest here this morning and you don't have a church home, a family to call your own, can I just invite you to consider Harvest? Can I invite you to come and consider Harvest as being part of your church family? We are a Bible-believing church home, and having church family is vital to our walk with the Lord. Amen. So this morning... As we wrap up, I want to send you out with this charge to always be about knowing God. Always be about hearing him. Trust that he wants to speak to you. Lean into what he has for you. 
what he reveals to you in his word and through moments of your life where you sense the Holy Spirit entrusting you with a treasure because he is good about that. Store the truth of his word in your heart. Cling to it and allow it to be a persistent pondering of your heart. Amen? Build with your prayers and acts of faith and obedience. We have a responsibility to act on what God shares with us. Amen? Not just to let it sit on the shelf, but we have a responsibility to be obedient. And be courageous and bold in what God has for you. A good hope and a future for you to build, and he is faithful. Remain faithful in doing good. Do not grow weary, and you will see your reward. I'm going to invite the worship team up and our altar ministry workers as well, if you would join me on the front here. Did you get anything out of the word this morning? Amen. 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 Praise God. I invite you to stand with me and thank you for your attentiveness. In addition to this charge, if you have a testimony, please share it. Amen. Please share it. Let that testimony be a blessing to others and to build others. But if, you, if you're here today... And you've been listening to this message and you're like, man, I would really like to hear God. Like she gave story after story where God led her and spoke to her, but I'd really like to hear God that way for my own life. The first step is to come into right relationship with Jesus. The first step is to make him Lord of your life. The Bible teaches that we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's nothing we can do in and of our own power to make ourselves right with the Lord. But Jesus came. He lived a perfect life, a sinless life, and he gave that life as a sacrifice on the cross so that we could come and know the Lord. And he rose three days later with resurrection power. And Jesus is alive and well today. And the Bible teaches us that to come into right relationship with the Lord, it says you must be born again. That means we must surrender our life to Jesus and ask him to come into our heart and be Lord, not just of our present, but Lord of our past. Lord, wash our past. Be Lord of my present. Be Lord of my future. And I just want to invite you today to pray this prayer with me. If that's you and you've never asked the Lord into your heart to be Lord of your life, or maybe you have walked with him, but you've fallen away and you're just like, I need that relationship restored. Let's pray together and just ask Jesus to come into our heart. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I am a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin and rose again. I don't want to live without you. I need to hear your voice. I want to know your purposes for my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Be Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And give me strength to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, you are born again. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now the next step is just learning to walk with him, amen? And we want to encourage you and help you along your, the way. And you can uh, scan this code to get more information or come up and talk with one of our ministry team here and let us just encourage you in your walk with the Lord and growing and just growing with the Lord. Amen? Amen. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close out the service. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for your word going forth. I pray that it takes root where it needs to take root, that it challenges us. Lord, I pray for opportunities for each and every person here to share their testimony this week. Lord, that they can expand that testimony and be a blessing to others, encouraging others and encouraging them to come closer to you. I pray that you bless each and every person here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.